Thank you very much, Zain, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for staying on in this session. It's a very important topic. But before I start off, I thought I'd just apologize. Uh, I know there's lack of gender diversity, which is a very bad omen considering the, the, the occasion yesterday. Uh, but I have to stress that as on behalf of our organizers, we did try our very best to get more women on the panel. But uh, uh, unfortunately, Prof Zeta had to drop, drop up because of an emergency. And, but we're very glad that uh, Prof Amin is, uh, Ad, uh, Rahim, is, it? Yeah, is here with us to represent the institution. So uh, this session is key because we talked about investment, we talked about ed economic development, we talked about governance and all those things. But the root of it is education. And that is very key in developing all those things that we discussed this morning. And I like to stress that another another key component that we need to take note of, which which is the changing landscape, not just for education but overall. So, in the area of digitalization, in the era era of uh, much change in the terms of how we socialize and all the effects that technology is is doing to us. How is education keeping up? And uh, for this, we have a very big group of speakers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, seven speakers. And I'm pretty sure we have a lot of things that we can ask them later on. Uh, we took note of the comments earlier on that we want more Q&A. We will try to allocate more time for that towards the end. Uh, but for now, uh, I'd like to uh, invite our panel to give uh, perhaps their introductory th thoughts uh, for about seven minutes each uh, on issues regarding education, the digi digitalization, uh, regarding the skill gap that, that we're facing, and uh, perhaps what kind of initiatives their own institutions are representing. I uh, have to say that not all are ed education institutions. We have one from the engineer board as well. And uh, he can, you can, can present uh, perhaps the more practical aspects of what's happening on the ground maybe uh, later on. So I'd like to first start with Professor... Technologist Dr. Mohammad Ibrahim Muttalib, uh, who is the Vice Chancellor of University Technology Patronas. So over to you, Prof. Thank you, Zenyi. That's the, the hazard of sitting next to the uh, facilitator. You've got to speak first. But anyway, right, uh, uh, my name is Mohammad Ibrahim Abdul Muttalib. I'm representing University Technology Patronas as Vice Chancellor. Now, a quick thoughts about education as we go forward. I think this is not something that you all don't know. It's, it's out there, clearly. As you can see, that uh, the, uh, the impact of uh, digitalization. Yeah? Uh, well, when I speak to um, the chairman of the Business Council, uh, German and Malaysia, he actually highlighted this specific term. I keep talking about digitalization, but he said automation. When I look at it, it actually makes sense eh? because automation, you know, we have all those um, uh, disciplines, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. Well, I'm an engineer, so I can speak, right? They serve as the foundation. The, um, the curriculum, the knowledge, I think it, it has not evolved very much. But what has happened... With the, with the advent of the uh, technology, particularly the digitalization or automation, the integration across discipline has now becoming more important. So I think this is a challenge, uh, one of the big challenges that the, that the uh, uh, education institution has to think about. How do we produce graduates that can think cross, cross discipline? Because more and more solutions that we need to work for the world involve multidiscipline. So you cannot be too gung-ho on one discipline. You have to have that breadth of the discipline in order for you to understand and then work on the solution. That's one. My second thought is, it's a bit worrying. When you look at the current generation, it looks like their interest towards, um, towards difficult subjects, you might put it that way, eh, is actually eroding. Right? And that's why I think now we're struggling to get students to go into engineering, science and technology. Uh, mind you, I think the government, including the private institution, has invested significantly. Uh, when, when we did a foresight earlier, we're looking at the, the country going forward. Technology has to, to drive 
the way forward. And suddenly now we're seeing a declining interest among the younger generations in technology. So that, that, that is something that, that I think higher institutions have to think very hard, be it public or private, to try to bring them back into, into this uh, subject. Okay? Thank you. What I, my institutions are doing? Ah, okay. Yeah, no, I'll talk no, about no. that later. Okay, sure thing, <laughs> right. sure thing. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ibrahim and Mutalib. Mut- Mut- I think uh, uh, we'll come back to a few points later on. It's very, um, very strange that uh, in, a, in a growing digital age, you mentioned automation as, as well, that uh, young people are actually becoming less interested. I thought they'll be more addicted to it, but uh, interesting. We'll, we'll probably dig on that much later on. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Engineer Associate Professor of Technology is Dr. Leong Ka Hon, who is the Honorary Secretary of the Institution of Engineering Malaysia, Perak Branch, to give uh, his thoughts. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, the uh, moderator. So um, I'm Dr. Leong here. I'm actually representing the Institute of uh, Engineering Malaysia, uh, Perak Branch, but I'm actually uh, also a uh, lecturer in University Tunku Abdul Rahman Kampa campus. Uh, so I think Prof. Uh, Ibrahim has just mentioned this now about the um, dropping and there's a drastic drop in terms of students enrolling in science and technology. But this is not just a Malaysia problem or uh, issue, but it is a worldwide. So as these institutions, uh, how we come in and support. So we have in, in Parak State, we have uh, three universities that we are working very closely at the moment. Uh, UTP, we have a student chapter. Even in Utah, we have student chapter. And now we just form a new student chapter in Polytechnic Unkoma. So basically, this um, is how the institution wants to support the, uh, the education sectors, the private or even the government um, uh, university, so that um, we can actually uh, narrow down the gap, uh, especially in terms of cultivating the strong interest. So we are not just uh, targeting the uh, university level. Uh, we are not just assisting the lecturers, but we are also uh, working closely with the university, like Prof. Ibrahim mentioned just now. We are really going all out to, to the school level, to the, even to the primary school, to really cultivate these strong um, uh, elements of uh, STEM, you know, uh, STEM education, uh, engineering, and sci- or science is not something very difficult, but something is very interesting. So as institutions, while we are supporting this, then uh, that's one thing that we are going on ground. Uh, the second thing is that the institutes are actually supporting these um, private, I mean, the education sector is we're actually encouraging now um, educators to really uh, come and do an attachment with the um, industry. We have people who really work uh, on and off with the practicing engineers from the institutions so that um, they are not some sort of like behind because we know, especially in terms of engineering, things are moving very fast, things are changing. So we also need to equip our educator so that they can actually deliver something that is very um, uh, uh, in trend or something that is uh, new technology to our students so that we don't have a very huge gap uh, in between uh, these uh, industry sectors and also the uh, education. So that is also one thing that we are supporting and we are actually encouraging all these uh, educators in the uh, university that we are working with and cooperating uh, so that they are actually uh, come and, and join these um, working practicing engineers. So that is the second that we are actually helping the uh, university. The third is we also have um, what we call a mentoring programs uh, with the students. Um, so we have these all these young engineers. We will not go get the senior, but we need to get all these young engineers who are just into the field to kind of mentor our new blitz of engineers. What are the expectations in the industry? What are the skill set that um, the bosses are looking at? So that is also one uh, program that we have just launched and I think Utah has conducted it and I think UTP did a very big, huge uh, event last year where they have a series of six weeks of uh, mentoring program with the uh, institute, uh, I mean the IEM, and together with their student chapter. So this is something that uh, currently are working on and uh, we are coming up with uh, more and more programs so that uh, to, to really um, narrow down the gap and also bring in more or encourage more students to enroll in science and technology. So this is something that uh, my thoughts for this at the moment, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Leong. So interesting. Uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, industry education collaboration to bring things up to date, not just among students' curriculum, but also getting the educators up to date as well. I mean, we're curious how, do, how, how time is managed though, but we'll probably circle back to that later. Like you need to teach, but also need to relearn. I suppose it's, it's a must, but how? Yeah, so I'll get back to that in a short while. 
Uh, next, we have we have Professor Dr. Abdul Rahim Muhammad Yusuf, who is the Dean for the Faculty of Business and Management at Quest International University. I understand Quest International University has dropped the P, the Perak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Woon. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm sorry, my voice is a little bit uh, down today. Right, um, I would like to sh first start this uh, sharing session uh, regarding education and reskilling by highlighting the in-demand skill for 2025, whether we are preparing our students for the in-demand skills for 2025. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, uh, the 10 in-demand skills for 2025 are, number one, Analytical, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, number four, critical thinking and analysis, number five, creativity, originality and initiative, number six, leadership and social influence, number seven, technology use, monitoring and control, number eight, technology design and programming, Number nine, resilience, stress tolerance, and flexibility. And finally, number 10, reasoning, problem solving, and ideation. So in preparing our students for the workforce, we will need to work towards um, achieving the um, needs of the in-demand skill for 2025. And um, from session two we had earlier this afternoon, I think there were also some issues raised with... Um, integrity, morality, and uh, what else that uh, is happening in the society today. I, I think uh, let's not forget also the philosophy of education. Right? They are this philosophy of education is to produce a well-balanced, or sometimes they call a well-rounded person. Maybe we are focusing too much on the intellectual and forget about the other important elements. Example, physical, emotional, and spiritual. So I think as educators, we will need to always go back and reflect on producing a well-rounded person or a well-balanced person. And we also need to always go back to the five pillars of education. The five pillars of education are pillar number one, Learning to know. Pillar number two, learning to do. Pillar number three, learning to be. Pillar number four, learning to live together. And finally, pillar number five, learning to transform society and change the world. Right? If we only focus on the intellectual dimension of student, then we are not producing well-balanced individual or citizens for the country. That is why we are having lots of other problems. We are producing maybe smart people, but they engage in criminal activities and probably nowadays high-tech criminal activities. All right? So I think let's address also that um, the... Um, um, the main uh, philosophy of education. And um, one uh, important um, element, I think, most universities, even at QIU, we try to in inculcate this entrepreneurial mindset in the students, right? Entrepreneurship and innovation. So at QIU specifically, we have two core subjects compulsory for all students all students will have to go through this design thinking and also discipline entrepreneurship. With these uh, two courses, we hope we will be able to prepare students right, to have that entrepreneurial mindset. And that entrepreneurial mindset is extremely important. Example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of people who lost their jobs became entrepreneurs. They are actually necessity entrepreneurs. Probably they went through some entrepreneurship courses during their school days or during their days. That's where they pick up and try to uh, learn 
new skills and some of them I think are now successful entrepreneurs who do not want to go back to their former jobs. Right? I think that's all for me for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, interesting that you mentioned the importance of an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, I'm Mark Zuckerberg's age and he has a dropout from Harvard. So, um, basically, he didn't stay in the university. He just dropped out and saw opportunity and went for it. Um, so, I don't know if halfway doing your entrepreneurship course, they will drop out because, like, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't need to study that's anymore. Another, <laughs> that's another dimension of entrepreneurship, actually. Opportunity entrepreneurship. We have necessity entrepreneurship, opportunity entrepreneurship. But I always don't, I don't want to tell the student no need to get your degree. Eh? <laughs> but I always want the student to get the degree eh? because, I mean, knowledge is always good. Eh? You can apply it anywhere. Eh? All right, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Professor. Right now we have uh, a, a person who trains educators uh, from UPSI, right? Uh, Professor Dato Dr. Muhammad Amin Muhammad Taf, who is the Vice Chancellor of University Pendidikan Sultan Idris down in Tanjung Malim. Tanjung Malim. Yeah, okay, right. So I'd um, like to hear his thoughts because uh, it's a key institution that trains educators for the country. So, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Boon. Uh, thank you to KSI, uh, Michi, and also Para Academy for inviting me to this wonderful uh, event. Before I start, may I know how many of you are bees or from Para? Can you put your hands up? Okay, thank you. And the rest, I'm sure that they are not from Para, right? So do you know that in Para, we have several first education institution. One of them is MCKK. Secondly is SITC, Sultan Idris Training College, which is now UPSI in Tanjung Malim. And the third one, the first TVET training center, Polytechnic Unko Omar. And currently we have more than 40 higher institutions in Perak. And while we are talking about the workforce, do you know that this year, the high school students in Pera alone is 163,000, closing to 164,000. Plus, the total population of Pera is the fourth in Malaysia. That's how big is the workforce in Pera. And how are we going to tap it? How are we going to utilize it? to help this once proper state to be greater and greater for our beloved Malaysia. I truly agree with what Prof. Rahim said just now. What is the purpose of education? Is it to prepare the future workforce or to create a future generation that know their responsibility towards humanity and sustainability. To me, to me, each and every one of us have different definition of the purpose of education. To me, it is three E, to embrace, enhance, and enrich humanities and civilization. And with that skills, inshallah, no matter whatever changes came, they will be prepared, not only for the workforce, but for the betterment of our beloved country. We know the technology, the world, everything is changing robustly. From science, then there's a separation of arts and science. I still remember during our time, you know, arts and science. Then came TVET. You know, then came STEM. Then came digital. It's, the world is ever-changing. It's always changing. But what we need to focus on is to prepare the future generation who is truly ready. And in that, a study by a group of researchers from several universities in Malaysia found that there are four gaps among the undergraduates or the future workforce in Malaysia. First, just like Prof. Rahim said just now, you know, yes, they are superb in academics, you know, they are very good in technical skills and stuff. First, they are lack of problem-solving skills. I'm not sure, but all, I'm sure many industries are here. Second is communication skills, literacy, 
and literally and digitally. Third, teamwork. And four, creativity. So these are the things I think that education should focus other than focusing on you know, the, the recent uh, changes that, that happened in the world. Yes, the world is ever-changing, but how? We equip them, not only with technical skills, but also with soft skills, the humanistic skills, the life skill experience. Yes, we know the salary is quite good now, but how many youngsters, you know, those who graduated from the university, you know, uh, declared bankrupt? How about their financial literacy? How are we, university and also education, preparing them for the skills of life, the reality of life? And therefore, I think this is what we can discuss and look forward. In University Pandidikan Sultan Idris, we are training teachers. Yes, so we equip them with several skills, especially in facing the digital world. First, the ethics of digital world. They need to know about it. You know, the responsibility, the opportunity, and also the sustainability, responsibility that they need to perform. Second is the skills of digital world. Digital literacy, data literacy, which is so, so important nowadays. DDD, data-driven decision is, you know, influencing the world. And then digital safety. How about the fourth? How about digital accessibility? Yes, we are in IPO. We have a very good connectivity and stuff. What happened to those students at post Kuma? What happened to the students at post Banun and stuff? So, education need to be online and offline so that we can have equal inclusivity and accessibility to all. Plus, digital creativity. Everybody, I'm sure uh, our generation, we have Facebook, right? Our generation. Because we are not TikTokers generation, right? No? Are there any TikTokers generation here? I don't think so. We are all Facebook generation or email generation. How many of us, you know, other than having Facebook, you know, making money out of it or doing something other than social things? You know, the digital creativity, it needs to, um, to be embraced in education. Plus... What is the future of digital world? We all know about the chat GPT. Google is so afraid of it. You know, Microsoft also surrendered. said, no, 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 no. It will take over all our search engines and stuff. We know that the immersive digital classroom is coming. You just imagine. Before this, we have experience-based learning in the environment, in the real situation. But now they built a classroom with the very digital immersive things. So it means like you are truly be there. Even we now, we have 5D cinemas. So things are changing fast, man. And then web-based apps. We don't need to wait for ages to download the apps in our phone. So you only maybe need 64 gigabyte phones only. You know, web-based. It's all web-based. It's all in the cloud. So how we prepare them. So what we are doing with online learning and stuff, we have the first digital library. Now we are establishing the faculty of computing and metaverse. People is asking me about metaverse. What is metaverse? Is it because of the uh, Spider-Man movie and stuff? I said, no, 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 no. Metaverse is something that unpredicted that will happen in the future. If you are talking about artificial intelligence, soon it will be artificial intuition. So how are we preparing our workforce, our kids, and the rest? With that, I thank you. Thanks. I think it's very encouraging to hear from uh, Prof. Zato. I mean... That uh, OC is taking so, much, so many steps to address these digital gaps and uh, providing digital safety, education, digital access, and so on. Um, but I think it's for it to be realized, especially in the remote areas, more effort needs to be available. Right, uh, I'd like to move on now to Dr. Vincent, uh, who's from Fairview, director of Fairview International School, and uh, I'd like him to give uh, his thoughts. Hi, everybody. Uh... Thank you, Kesha, for having me here. Wonderful panel uh, with a lot of good educators and great points. I'm so happy that I'm hearing all of the same things that I'm resonating about. Thank you. I've got to start my stopwatch. So I'll, I'll try and be. I'll try and speak from a, a high school perspective because everybody here is in university. Nobody's standing up for the little guys. 
Um, I'm going to start with a story. I had a student once, a brilliant scholarship student from a Chinese school, 10 A's in SPM, come over to do the IB diploma with me. And this student came up to me one day and said, your, sir, your teachers are rubbish. I said, why? Well, what's, what's wrong with my teachers? They, they produce a lot of great results. The kids love them. What's going on? She said, during the revision time last week, none of the questions that the teacher went through came out in the exam. And I thought, what on earth is going on over here? And the more I dug into this scenario and the more I started to understand, I realized that there was a serious problem um, that this girl had, this mentality. And if you dig into it, it's, it's really a big problem. Everybody's working to the exams. And we've heard this narrative so many times now. Education will not move forward until we change what we measure as success. That's going to be it. No matter how much we teach our teachers to teach in fantastic ways, no matter how much we bang the drums and yell it out from the, the rooftops about how wonderful we can educate people, the, end, the reality is if the end point, if what we value, what we measure and what we celebrate as success is not changed, all of that narrative is for nothing. Let me give you a more uh, specific example. If we value our children's ability to grow up and be communicative people, people who talk to other people like real human beings and have flexible mindsets, then if we do not measure that and celebrate its success in our students with a, an objective scale of some sort, our children will know that our words have no teeth and they will not bother because the rest is just useless narrative. That's the reality. We need to change the way that we assess and we need to do it fast. Because for 13 years of education, if you tell a kid, the only thing I value in you when I say the word define this definition is for you to memorize and say exactly the same sentence as what I told you to memorize in my textbook. If that's the way that you teach a kid to think, then the message that you tell children to remember as adults is the only thing of value to you is the ability to regurgitate exactly what I told you. When we have kids in the workforce, uh, adults in the workforce today, not just kids, they never uh, come up to us and say, Boss, uh, next week performance review, uh, can you tell me your questions so I can uh, memorize the answer for it uh, for next week? If they did that, surely you give them one tight slap already. So if that is the case going on there in the workforce, why are we doing it to our kids? Why are we lying to ourselves and doing more and more past year papers, sending our kids for more tuition classes to memorize and memorize? It is a crazy system. So point one, change the assessment. We need to assess and measure success correctly based on what actually matters. Now, actually, I would argue that skills aren't what matters uh, going forward. Chat GPT, if anything it's taught us already, is that it just Google nullified knowledge. That's the first problem. Chat GPT just killed off skills, by the way. Uh, communication skills, Chat GPT and its evolution, uh, there's, a, there's a website called Syndicate that it's actually a web place to trade AI programs on the metaverse right now. And you should see the kind of stuff they have over there. The skills they can duplicate with AI are ridiculous, right? From everything from building a giant Excel sheet. You can say, build me an Excel sheet that creates a budget for me and my wife taking into account these 16 factors and will create the whole spreadsheet for you. Now, if an AI can do that, that is an advanced skill that is just taken away. And I used to be a doctor and I know a lot of us are under threat too. The one thing that AI cannot do though, and I will tell you this because this is the only thing that I suspect will give our children a continued edge in our future is how to create and build relationships. That is the only thing AI cannot do and will never be able to do as far as we can see. And therefore, if we want to build a group of individuals from childhood and give them a sustainable edge going forward into the future for at least the next 30 years, teach them how to build and create powerful relationships. That's going to be the key. The second question that was put forward was about entrepreneurialism and innovation. I don't know. I think entrepreneurship is a little bit overbuzzed these days. Not everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. I think everybody should have that experience. It's really nice. But up 50 to 95% of startups fail. 
I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know about you, but I don't want my children burning a hole through their pocket because they got a crazy idea that everybody should be an entrepreneur. Some people are meant to be great doctors, good doctors, and they really shouldn't have an entre- a, a business. I know many of my doctor friends who should have just stayed as doctors because when they transferred across to run their own clinic, it was an absolute disaster. Um, so innovation, uh, that's an interesting one. I'm going to come to my, thir- my final point. I've got 30 seconds to go, but I'll give it to you. The most important thing I think that we can teach or help our children with is to make our teachers coaches. Stop teaching coach. Children today can find out everything they want to find out. We need to employ the skill of coaching, not teaching. See, teaching is, you don't know Jack, listen to me because I'm smarter than you. That's teaching. Coaching is, you have the answer, I'm going to draw it out of you, and I'm going to help you overcome that, but I'm not going to give it to you because you have the answer, and most important narrative, I believe you can get there. Now, that's a really important narrative that teaching destroys. When teaching goes, listen to what I say, don't think for yourself, that inevitably says to the kid, what you think doesn't matter. Now, if our teachers are retrained with coaching skills to help our children achieve their outcomes that they choose by themselves, we're going to have a very, very different environment. School is literally now going to be a place where you just provide good resources, help kids get good plans, and then coach them as they run their way to success. That's, I believe, going to be the most powerful thing we can do for our children moving forward. Thank you, and sorry I went over time. No worries. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincent, for teachers becoming coaches and... uh being aware of what AI can do. I don't know. Maybe AI one day you can type in ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT, I want Dr. Vincent to be my friend. Make it happen. <laughs> I don't know. That would be really scary if that happens. Anyways, I've uh, got two more speakers before we go into another set of questions. Uh, I'd like now to uh, pass the floor to Professor Gopi, who's the Dean at the Faculty of Education at University College Fairview, UFC. So over to Prof. Gopi. Right. Thank you, Mr. Woon and the members uh, who are up here. I've, and of course, those who are eagerly listening. Number one, all of you are speaking in from information technology on IT, digitalization and all that. The only IT I know is at home, is 3 <laughs> That's the only IT I know. So uh, in terms of education reskilling, I think people like me have to go through that process first. And coming from that era where we didn't have all these things and today I am at a university guiding teachers in terms of technology. So imagine the speed and learning that I have to go through. The children they don't know they know about TikTok, then I have to learn more about TikTok than them. So the process of learning on university lecturers is even more greater than anybody else. So please pity us educationists. <laughs> we, we really suffer a lot, quietly. We all don't know how much of pain we have to go through. And, and to have to take care of the IT at home some more. I, I mean my history too, you know? Because we cannot spend time more there. We have to spend more time. Especially after retirement, we have to spend more time there, right? But because of this technological change, uh, chat GPT was another thing that suddenly came out of the bush and everybody was saying, oh, this is plagiarism and all that. I said, no, I'm so happy chat GPT came. It made my work easier. <laughs> I, I give you, I will give credit to, to the source. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you give credit, it's wrong. Perfectly fine. At one time, we never allow our children to use calculator. Cannot, must memorize. Timetable. 5 times 2, wait, 5 times 2. Hey, hey. 5 times 2, 10, I also don't know. But now, we allow everybody to use. Why? Because it's speed. We want speed. So what is wrong? Perfectly okay. The issue is, I echo it, my learned friends from both the universities, especially OC. Uh, they're doing a lot. Similarly, we at University College Fairview also specialize in certain areas which I'll come to during the other questions. 
I'll, I'll speak more on that. But when it comes to reskilling education, ensuring the readiness of the workforce, I think one of the most important things Institute of Higher Education like us is how do we reskill all the existing old timers in the school? They are the one who's destroying everything. Why? They're not ready to learn. They're not ready to learn. Send for courses, pay for yourself, nobody will go. Confirm. Nobody will attend. Kela government pay. They will attend. Half a day. Half a day, don't know where they went. So nowadays they have to take attendance already to, to confirm and all. After that, come back to the school. Technically, what should happen? They should be conducting a CPD or a professional development to, to support everybody. It will never happen. Confirm, will not happen. If it happens, you will see the school changing. I had the privilege of working with an headmaster who had that mindset when I was in the government sector. The idea of reskilling was already inculcated in me when I first went into the teaching profession. And after my teacher's training at the same university, uh, same maktab with uh, Prof. Maktab Raghuram Temenggong Ibrahim in Johor Bahru, uh, at that time there was a beautiful program on television, uh, Fantasy Island, the plane, the plane, you know. So, uh, and then I got my posting. You are posted to Sekolah Menengah Pulau Ketab. Wow, Pulau Ketab, Pulau Island, so nice, so happy. Then, my first day from Port Klang, I had to take a boat. To take to go to the boat, I needed to go in a sampan. Oh, that also got some sort of a toll gate. Lah. Sampan. Must pay the sampan for her. So after that, one and a half hours all the way. Then from far, I see, wow, nice. Everything on stills, you know. Houses all on stills. Hey, where's the beach? Ah? No beach, ah? The moment I reached there, everything on sales. Underneath all water. The school. Underneath all water. I, th I, th I, th I was thinking, how the hell am I to get out of this? So I tried to play my way out. And everybody there, only one ethnic group, Chinese. 100%. Go to sports day. Sekolah menengah Pulau Ketam, all Chinese. Sekolah menengah Lumur, all Malay. Sekolah menengah Pulau Keri, all Indian. True. <laughs> three, three island. <laughs> three ethnic group. Very interesting. So, cannot speak Bahasa. So, I was trained to teach math and science. The first thing they taught, it must have said, ah, you Indian. Very good. You teach English. I said, I said what? I said, I was trained to teach math and science. No, 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 you teach English. I don't know whether the students learn English for three years there, but I learned Hokkien and Teochew, when I was there. <laughs> that three years I learned. I reskilled myself to learn one language so I can speak that language quite well. <laughs> so, what the message was, the headmaster was able to con bring that school, which was at that time SRP, huh? no form 4, form 5. Huh? We were the last school in the whole of state of Selangor. SRP. Last Confirm, non-stop for many years. The year I went, second year, th three years I was there, together with the team. He was also a new headmaster. He also joined Mr. Chong. Wherever you are, you're great. We really work hard, reskill all our teachers, change the mindset of the students. Don't use all the pedagogical approach that we learn about past year questions. As you said, ah, remove all that. Teach them approaches to learning, which we are doing now. Teach them how to learn. So, by the end of the third year, we became the top 10 in Slango, in SRP. <laughs> Three years transformation. Top 10. <laughs> the government was surprised. Sultan came. Pengarah came. Ketua Pengarah also came. They all want to know what happened. And he was given a gold medal and chain. And the school was upgraded to have Form 4 and Form 5, both uh, science stream. In, in. So that, all because 
the attitude of the teachers changed. They were ready to reskill. They were ready to transform. But the only reason why they did it was they have nowhere to go. All island one. All still. Where to go? So study lah. <laughs> that was the only reason why it happened. Hear too much of the things happening. All right. So I think I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Gopi. Uh, very interesting sharing. Yeah, I, I, what I picked up from that is uh, the importance of mindset, the importance of willpower. Uh, by the way, my, my mom also teached at uh, Pola Ketam, first posting in two years, uh, and I was there recently. Very good, Hochen. So you should go if you, if you have time. Right, we got one more speaker before we start another round. Uh, we have Mr. Lee Chalky, who's the campus principal at Tembi International Schools of Ipoh, and uh, we're very looking forward to hearing his thoughts. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. That's better. Okay. You, you mentioned at the start about being the first person to speak. I think going at the end, when you've heard, heard so many comments, um, my piece becomes, I guess, a bit more of a summary. Um, you know, at, at Tembi Ipo, you know, we, we've got students who are two years old through to 18, 19 years old. And if we think about the points that have been made um, this afternoon, so many of those resonate with, with me and what we're trying to achieve in that school. And one of the things that we have to be really mindful of is that it is unlikely that education will ever be able to keep up with the digital transformations that are taking place. We are forever going to be chasing the future. So what's really important is in best preparing our children and our students for the future, we need to think about another way. We've already spoken here today about sort of problem-based learning, about ensuring that our children are independent thinkers. I think so much in education at the moment is is problematic because we still run systems where we treat the teacher as the expert. In so many things, as adults and as teachers, we're not actually the experts anymore. It's people perhaps as young as seven and eight when we think about technology who are far in advance of where so many of our teachers are. Is it realistic that we're actually going to be able to go and retrain all of our teachers? Probably not in terms of technology. We've had technology in our schools for 20 years, 30 years. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess a blackboard was technology at one time. We've just adapted to technologies, but we carry on using it perhaps 20 years too long. So many of our schools have smart boards in. Really, they're just... Uh, glorified projection devices for many. So really it's about how do we transition our students into becoming leaders of their own learning. Now, with AI, we already have the technology that would allow each individual student to run their own pathway through school. The actual role of a teacher could become redundant in a traditional sense if education is about knowledge. Knowledge is everywhere. Every one of you in this room can be in touch with anything you really want to be with a flick of a switch. It's the same with our students. But we continue to run education systems that actually limit what our students and children can achieve. And some of the leadership of this has got to come from the universities. I've been encouraged actually by what I've heard. But until that really becomes systematic throughout the world. Getting placed in university is still going to come down to ultimately how successful you are in achieving good examination results. We have to find other ways of celebrating success. And universities need to be the leaders on this. Because examination boards are going to be slow to move. That's their bread and butter. That's what they make their money from. And if I think about the O-levels that I did back in 1987 and what an IGCSE looks like today, very little difference. 
Very little difference. But the world is a very, very different place. Now, I first started teaching overseas back in 1995, and I was working in Kenya at that time. There was no internet then. In fact, if I was going to call home, I used to have to go through an operator. Hopefully, they could book me a time to be able to call home, and I would go back at one o'clock in the morning, perhaps, to make a call through to my parents back in the UK. 1995 used to be the time I would write the Christmas letter to all my friends and write it, and then I used some technology because I used to photocopy it, put it in an envelope, and send it around the world. What we were asking students to do then is pretty much exactly what we're asking students to do today in terms of our examination systems. So for us to be better prepared for the digital age, we've got to fundamentally change what education is about and how we measure success. It is not possible for every child to be a straight A student or a 40 plus diploma student in the IB. And if we're going to take digital technology and if we're going to take the fourth, you know, the fourth revolution here, we must put humanity at the heart of that. We must consider every person on the planet. It cannot be another means of isolating people. It has to empower. And, and through education, we have to find ways of having success and, and uh, um, celebrating success for those students who perhaps are less able. What is the future for them? What are the pathways for them? Not everybody is going to be able to be an engineer, a doctor. If technology is going to lead to machines and is going to lead to better productivity, some of those roles that students might have had who were less able won't be there in the future. So how do we make their life meaningful? So what I'd like us to be doing as we think about the digital, um, digital age is actually turn it around and start from the basis of how will a digital age transform the lives of everybody in the world. That should be the starting point. We can always find an economic advantage with that. But unless we really keep humanity, the environment, and you know our future generations right in the center of what we're trying to achieve, then all the digital age is going to do is just disenfranchise a different group of people. So in terms of what we have to do with students, we've got to create students who are empathetic, inquisitive, who care about others, who want to make a difference. Because through digital technology, there is a danger of we start hearing singular voices. There is the option of collective power. But even with collective power, we have to be careful. We have to encourage our students to ask questions. So I go back to where I just started this. We have to, within our education systems, move away from a system where the teacher is expert and we actually give voice to our students to be able to direct their own learning because they will push the ceiling far higher than our present system allows. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, so much for the input. So it's basically about how one adapts and manages and uh, how to be successful uh, through teaching students to be inquisitive and uh, how they manage the overall situation. So thanks so much for that point. Um, with permission of the speakers, I'd like to change things up a bit. I actually have uh, individual questions for each of them, but uh, Matt's fail, calculated my time wrongly. <laughs> and uh, I, I think what we'll do is that I'll still post personal questions to you, but I would like to, before you answer those questions, i also open it to the floor. And when we, we, we take on my questions and theirs, we can answer it one shot. Then we have a good uh, discourse. So uh, my first question agree, will be... Agree. Take their question and we will put our answers through their question. Oh, yes, yes, for sure, yes. And uh, now let me just pose the first question to um, uh, Professor Ibrahim Mutalib. Um, as a tech university, UTP is a tech university, um, how have you seen changes, especially in the, in the STEM fields? Uh, some of the speakers have been alluded that changes are very fast, but really, how, how is it, has it been a, been a problem and how have you adapted to it? So that will be my question for you later on. Uh, maybe we will go on Ralphus and then... Uh, We'll take some questions from them. Uh, for 
Professor Leong, um, being in the industry as well in IEM, uh, have you really seen uh, a skill gap among your graduates? And you've really alluded to programs that, that try to bridge it. Um, but how how does how does higher education, your colleagues in the higher education sector, how do we incorporate more relevant uh, syllabus in, to keep up with the trends? Um, next is for Professor Rahim. Um, what are the challenges private universities uh, face in their push for an IR 4.0 compliant uh, syllabus? I know we alluded to it cannot be just about tech, cannot be just about, about, about uh, training business sense is overall, but uh, IR 4.0 is a is an incoming threat, and how does uh, private universities prepare for that? Uh, next question is both to prof to Dr. Vincent Kwok and uh, uh, Mr. Lee, uh, both being private schools, and uh, from your observation, uh, how do current students compare, and uh, how we've seen a trend that private schools are becoming more popular among Malaysians, and uh, I'd like to get your opinions on why that is the case. Uh, next would be to Prof Gopi. Um, I think I want you to get you to share a little bit about your IB program, the training uh, program. So I'd like you to talk more about that. Uh, Professor Dato Amin, um, I'm interested to know your, your thoughts about teacher workloads because uh, my feedback from public schools is that they're overburdened. So how has, uh, now that we've got digitalization, preparing for all these things. How has it added to their workload? I'm really keen to know about that. And uh, before we open up, because each panel member will have some time to speak, I'd like to open it to the floor first. Do you have questions for the speakers? And uh, when you post your questions, I'll let you to perhaps introduce yourselves and uh, yeah, post your questions in a short manner. But don't, don't give a statement. Give a question. <laughs> okay. Uh, I believe we've got uh, one gentleman there. Oh, hi. Okay. All right. Um, my name is Song. I have a few questions based on what has been shared by the panel. Now, first one was by Dr. Vinson. Yeah, he, he was mentioning about changing the way uh, we measure what we value as well as the approach of teaching. So in that case, do you, do you, are you of the opinion that it is the curriculum that needs to be changed? Or is it just the implementation? Because if it's the implementation, uh, my question would be, where should it start? Should we, should we begin in the primary or secondary schools? But even that, certain skills are hard for us to nurture, especially for young learners. Or should it begin in the teacher academy? Should the teachers be the one changing their approaches first? And then uh, I remember... Uh, professor, oh, my eyesight is very bad. <laughs> yes, uh, too many professors. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, uh, um, you were sharing your experience in Pulau Ketam, where the entire team got together and changed their style, which uh, brought good results. My question is, uh, that would require a good team. So if you, we were try to build up teachers who have that, capacity. However, we'll be placing them in already established systems. So how can then, uh, how, how can you ensure that whatever you have initiated propagates? Because they'll be entering an already established system and you have mentioned that not all principals are receptive of that. So uh, would, they, would that like put cold water over the fire that you're starting to change? Yeah. And uh, as for, I think, Mr. Chokli, he, he, he did mention about some qualities to build upon young learners. So this is more on the context itself because in an Asian setting, some of the good qualities that we are trying to nurture that we expect a leader to have, uh, for example, being inquisitive, uh, being more forthcoming in exploring your ideas, uh, it can be what the employers do not want from the employee. So how then should the education progress? Should we go towards the kind of individual we want to develop? Or should we focus how can this individual 
work well, function well in the in the society. Yeah. And I guess right, the uh, Mr. Sang, how many more questions do you have? Last one. Okay, last one. go for it. Uh and last one was uh I think one of the professors was talking about the qualities that the World Economic Forum uh suggested. Uh one of them was the high order thinking skills. And I know that the Malaysian education blueprint also states clearly that they want to push forth that because uh, they, they do realize that that is the needed skill. Uh, but other than that, there was resilience as well. So um, from my experience, resilience comes from experiencing failures. So the last question would be, should the education system learn to embrace failures? Because we were talking about how can we measure success but what about how students can learn to overcome failures? Because if that is not part of the curriculum thought, I think that they will just live through a life where they just want successes. And when failures, failures hits, that's the end of the road. So that's all. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Song Kwai Kit, for all those questions. Uh, I believe you've written it down. I've written it down briefly in case you've forgotten. Um, perhaps you take one or two more questions before we go for it. Yep. Gentlemen over there. Mic, this mic on. Uh, Tin, uh, PA team. Or maybe try the middle mic, sir. Oh, there's one more on the side as well. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. My name is Gani Sanvelu. Um, let me just give me some background. Um, I was in uh, MNC for almost 25 years, and I just share my experience, and at the same time, um, when I look into the education and reskilling, uh, that recalls me um, how does uh, I think most of you or acad academician that I can I can see from here look like all of you are an academician, right? So my question to you is misalignment between skills and aspiration. That means um, if you look at Para, one of the biggest company that we have is Semiconductors. And number of workers down there is almost six to 5,000 people down there, working down there. Isn't it? So, and most of them are going out, out of Perak. They're going to Penang. They're going to Singapore. And the best skill center that we have is Perak Entrepreneur Skill Center. But how do you prepare for the youngsters to, to go as, an, as a new, as a worker in in this sort of industry. So uh, this is misalignment between skill and aspiration. My first question. Well, my second question. <clears throat> how do private sectors, how do private sectors, you could get ready your bank of workers to face the new challenges? Because the current challenges is at most, very, very, very tough with the latest technology that we have. So how are we going to prepare to have a very good workforce for Pera? Like um, MSKK, SINCC, Unku Omar, all these are academicians. But I'm talking about the ground. You work as an engineer. One simple example, I interviewed a guy as an engineer I asked him, you are graduated, where do you work? No, it's a new experience. There you go. You got no job. Because I need, I'm a private sector. I need somebody who, with experience. Then where does the, the fresh guys go? Unless they become a grab driver. So this private sectors must come forward. <coughs> must come forward to help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ganesan. So I see uh, basically it's a skill mismatch. Uh, basically also the issue of underemployment where you don't match a level of skill to the job that you have. I believe there's one more gentleman. Ah, thank you, sir. So one more quick question and then we will have a live fire round of uh, answering. Uh, hello, uh, this is Mirza here. I'm basically from the youth. So one important question would be is, 
how is ChatGPT a threat to our education system? So the first question to the board is basically how ChatGPT is a threat to our education system and why is it a threat? As, uh, as in because our assignments, our works, whatever we have, it can be done via ChatGPT. So basically, AI is doing it for the students who are studying right now. So we cannot have the options of assignments as the future because ChatGPT will do it for us. So the students are not learning. So how do we use ChatGPT into our education system rather than saying, no, don't use ChatGPT, it will stop you from thinking and all. Learn how to prompt. That's number one. And number two, for those who don't want to become like, you know, basically labors towards the uh, system, for entrepreneurs, like as what Dr. Vincent said, what would you suggest for students like entrepreneurs to do? How would they learn the optimal entrepreneurial skills? So as in, how do we know which grants do we get? How do we apply grants from the university, from the government? Because like uh, we have FYP projects which are really, really forward thinking. But then it stops there. So if our FYP can be brought up to the next level towards uh, into production, rather than being hired, we can start hiring people at Fresh Graduate. So I think this will be one thing that will really push the country forward also. So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you do you mind repeating your name one last time? I didn't catch it earlier. Sorry, Mirza. which one? My name? Yeah. yeah. Mirza Adam from UDP. Okay, good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, good to have a question from the youth. All right. So over to you, Prof. Okay. It goes in the same order, is it? <laughs> I, I thought well, I thought I thought by age I should start first. <laughs> oh, uh, by age I, I don't ask age. Uh, it's not polite these days. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, I kind of miss in terms of sharing with you all on what UTP have done uh, in terms of uh, pushing forward um, our model of of the undergraduate education, particularly. Right. Um, fortunately, the questions that was put to me also is in, in the sense that how does UTP tackle you know, in going forward, yeah? Uh, how do we tackle uh, uh, the systems of education we had in order to address uh, this um, advent in this, this fourth industry? Producing the graduates that is desired by the industry, yeah? So we've heard uh, questions about mismatching between, between the, uh, uh, the expectation from the industry and the skills of graduate being produced, right? Okay, um, when we started UTP in 1997, right? we have actually conducted a study. Yeah? Uh, and what we found was that, through indeed what the whole lot of my friends have been saying up here, education is not just about uh, knowledge. Yeah? It's not just about knowledge. As a matter of fact, and knowledge is just one of the attributes. And there are the six attributes that we have identified. Yeah? And that's where we brand it as the well-rounded graduates. Yeah? That was in 97, 98 when we started. And based on, we designed our curriculum. Yeah? Now, when I say curriculum, designing curriculum is one thing, is the content of the program. Yeah? Meaning to say what exactly goes in, what courses goes in, yeah? uh, 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 in terms of trying to uh, provide the students with this balanced knowledge. That's one. Secondly, we, are, we know that there are six other attributes, right? Critical thinking, solution synthesis ability, yeah? communication skills, practical aptitude, yeah? entrepreneurial skills. Yeah? So these are the other skills that we have identified. Of course, if you, these skills re require you to build competency and you cannot just teach them in class. Yeah? It's not the same as knowledge. Yes, they need to know, but they also need to actually do or practice. Yeah? And that's where we devise our delivery system around that. Yeah? So I, I must say that I was fortunate to be the fourth VC because the first, second and third VC have prepared for me the technology that helped us to go into the new, uh, into the new style of, 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 of uh, education delivery. Yeah? Uh, so now I have with me uh, well, not me per se, my, my lecturers, my guys over there as well, yeah? 
We've got classroom which we have built-in technologies that can assist. Yeah? And we are embarking away from lecturing. Uh, in fact, we have, we have, since we started, we introduced the model of facilitators of learning. Yeah? I think if, if you know how to actually use that a bit, tune that a bit, it can become a coach. Right? Because you are not shoveling knowledge to the student, but you are coaching and helping them in order to master the knowledge. Yeah? So it, it's something that, 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 that we have done. And I think in 2005 or six, the government of Malaysia, Mohi, come up as well with the importance of this soft skill. And again, I think recently, our newly appointed Minister of Higher Education, he termed it as the uh, sharp and smart skills in his speech. Yeah? Again, that goes into the importance of embedding the, the, the so-called soft skills uh, the, this, this into, the, into the graduates yeah? with the hope that they'll be able to, um, uh, to survive uh, when they go out, yeah? uh, pursuing their life. Yeah? So this is something that, 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 that we have done. And, and coming back to the point when I sort of highlighted earlier, right? Um, I thought after that, we now have a more difficult situation, right? Which is, you know, um, I think either one of us was highlighting. You know, if you produce somebody with a very deep um, discipline base, yeah? when we all know currently the world are facing problems that requires multidiscipline, multidisciplinary approach to solve it, we'll get again, into a silo argument, right? Uh, and that is what we, we now realized and we saw that a number of the, uh, the instit leading institution in Europe and in the US are trying to, I wouldn't like to use this term, um, something like the general-based education. Yeah? Uh, initially, I thought it's general engineering, but no. If you go there to EAC, you'll get crushed, right? <laughs> so, it's, it's something that allows the graduate to master a certain, a certain discipline of his choice, while at the same time, you provide them with the breadth of the other discipline. So that while you are good in your discipline, you have an appreciation. Yeah? Now, it's going to be difficult if, if we want them to learn the whole thing. Yeah? But one thing that we, we, we discovered, and in fact, this is one of the things that we've been implementing right from the beginning when we started, is... A, a, a substantial sort of a, 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 a certain duration of internship. Yeah? So we make it compulsory right from the beginning. Even at one point in time, we had a tough challenge with, uh, with accreditation, EAC. Yeah? We put in seven months, seven to eight months of internship. Yeah? Now, when the student goes for the internship, they actually picked up not only the ability to understand cross-discipline, yeah, because they are pro proposing solutions that involve cross-department, not just specifically what they're doing. And another thing is they're also sharpening up their, pre their presentation skills, human relations, yeah, learning how to work in a team. So industrial experience, this internship experience can actually give a lot of value adding to the students. So we have been keeping that. Uh, even at one point in time, We've got difficulty with the accreditation body, but we, we, we stood by it. Yeah? And until now, we are still doing it. But of course, if, if my whole colleagues are thinking about, or rather if Dato' Amin is thinking about doing it at UPSI, I don't know whether we will have enough place <laughs> from the industry to actually cater for the student. That is a challenge. Getting the placement is a challenge. But once you've got that, you must make sure that the placement makes sense in training the students, and you will see. When the students come back, they are a different person. That is what we experience, yeah. Uh, um, the placements are good, yeah. Yeah, uh, and then talk to, uh, just to answer Misa. Uh, <laughs> now, in terms of entrepreneur, it's something that you can learn. Just, just, uh, just learn the knowledge. But again, it's 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 actually a skill, or in a way, it's also built into the person, right? So, what we do at UTP, we have something like informal programs. We don't want to sort of all the time build it as a formal program, informal program, where the student can sort of get involved with it voluntarily. Yeah? Uh, we bring in speakers from, uh, from the various government agencies just to share the opportunities where, yeah, Miza, uh, uh, to get the grants from. 
And then uh, we also bring uh, entrepreneurs to actually share their experience just to give an idea uh, on what you need to sort of explore or do if you wish to build up yeah, uh, a startup or business if you have an idea. Right? Uh, uh, and then we also have, let's suppose somewhere along the line, you have built it up to a serious point, they will try to find a coach that can actually help you yeah, to, to take it through further. Yeah? Uh, and last but not least, I just want to highlight one more thing, that what we are trying to do. This is something related to the student experience. Now we're trying very hard to uh, work on the, the environment in the university so that we can create a student experience that will enable them to develop the whole lot of these skills, right? If you're looking at uh, uh, um, the, the, the ability to master digital, di digitalization, so we, have, we, we, we try our best to prepare uh, what are the, the infrastructure needed, yeah? uh, what are the facilitation that our IT teams can give yeah, to make it easy so that they don't feel very difficult to actually be part of it. And in terms of building leadership, we are beginning to empower the students to even do business in the university. Yeah? Do business, run clubs, uh, 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 do big functions. Yeah? It's empowered to them and we are there, our, our, our staff are there to help giving them advice and guide them. Yeah? Okay, I think too much already. No, no, thank you so much for that. Thank point. you. Yeah. Uh, encouraging entrepreneurism in the university, excellent. I wonder where they get the capital from though, the fees. So. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, um, all right uh, Professor Leong, over to you. Oh, thanks. I think um, there's always a gap. That's why um, there's always unemployment you know, news we heard about all this. But as an institution, how we can actually assist uh, the university? Like, um, for example, um, we're actually working very, very closely with the university. It's just that we want to really close up this gap. And then how we are doing it is actually, um, we, we are actually bringing in uh, engineers, new working engineers, practicing engineers to the university and, and also giving Coaching, I think Prof. Ibrahim mentioned a very good point here is we are now mo moving towards the directions of coaching rather than teaching. You know, we are coaching our youngsters. And I believe that and I strongly think that our j younger generations are very, very creative. I think this credit needs to be given to them. And, and how we nurture this and how we actually bring them up to the next level is by coaching. Let them have um, the opportunity to speak up, to give their ideas. And, and that's where the institution coming in and IEM coming in to support on this matter. That is why. Um, and lately in these few years, uh, even before pandemic, uh, things have been very promising. And I think we have a lot of industry players. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, engineering perspective. Is, um, there's, there's a lot of this industry coming in with a problem. And we use these problems to work with the university and as a final year project or, or even to the extent of a very simple uh, assignment. So that is also another approach how IEM is supporting. And because, um, and I say promisingly, is all these industry players are coming with a problem. And I think there's a certain trust and certain corporations given uh, from the industry. That is also very enriching. That is how we can actually work together, not just from the uh, university level, but or, or even in the IEM uh, level, but the industry players are coming in. Um, take for example, now we also work uh, with Utah to develop uh, what we call work-based program where we're actually two years in the university in Utah, and one year, uh, the students will be actually attached in the industry. And the university actually developed the final year course, all the courses in the final year, together with the industry, so that the content, the syllabus are all very relevant and up to date. And this group of students, they will immediately be absorbed by the uh, industry. It's not just about the internship, but it's actually started even way before the internship. So this is how uh, things are evolving, and I think it's how things are changing. I think I also would like to address some of the uh, question and comment from the floor of the panel. Um, we are also going from the very traditional way of assessing students. You know, we're no longer uh, asking students to submit 10 pages of reports, 20 pages, which is the, the previous old generations. That, and I think this youth questions, uh, ChatGPT, is a form of a very useful tool for students. I think, six for, for example, my own students, FYP students, within half an hour, he can actually summarize a synthesis method. I was very surprised because I did my PhD with running through how many number of journals. I can't even summarize a method within the 30 minutes. Then I asked him, how, how come you can actually do it so fast? ChatGPT, sir. 
So imagine this kind of tools actually helps to assist student learning if you use it in a proper way. And I think from an educator from the university of Texas, we need to change the assessing method. You know, we know that they can always write a very good uh, reports or things in an assignment. Then we don't assess them through that manner. Maybe assess them in a different way. Maybe can you summarize in a poster? And now students are very creative. If you ask them to do a three minutes or five minutes video, they can immediately do it for you. If you ask them to write a report of 20 pages, they will take ages. So, so we are also changing, and I think thanks to the policy, the accreditation boards also allow us to have this kind of flexibility. I think th th things are changing, but I think we are more moving towards uh, in terms of coaching. I think that would be the word, rather than teaching or even lecturing, I think is not so appropriate, but it's a coaching. We actually develop together with these, the youth. I think that is uh, some of the approach that uh, I think uh, IEM is assisting the, the university and I think um, this is what we are actually currently helping uh, the, the, the university that in, in the Parag region. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Professor Leong. I thought I'd just jump in with uh, my own comment because I am I'm not an industry player, but I'm, we, work, we, run a, we run a think tank. And uh, you, you mentioned earlier that there's an there's a attachment program. I think most universities have this and this was introduced the 2U, 2I concept, right? Okay. So there are pros and cons. I appreciate that uh, these are, this is a way to get students to get experience. But what we, we had uh, in KSI is we had the flood of applications to intern. But 80% of them, I was there saying even 90, when they applied, they did it because they had to. And when, they, when we do the interview, it's obvious that they didn't even do a background on what company this is. Ah, because I want to do business. It's like, KSI is a think tank, you know, we don't have business expect. <laughs> So we have this kind of situation that we, 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 I mean, I think I like to echo what you all said. It's about getting them to be, to look at the situation, you know, use the brain a bit, not so much focus on the, on the, on the knowledge, but how you apply that knowledge. So yeah, I agree to that. Thanks so much. Next, uh, we have, uh, Prof Rahim for your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me address, uh, the question raised by the gentleman earlier regarding um, resilience, stress tolerance, and flexibility. Uh, I agree, we definitely need to teach uh, learners uh, to learn to embrace failure, right? Um, but um, we will not purposely design students to fail, especially like um, uh, for QIU tomorrow uh, on Saturday. We are going to uh, organize a neon night run. Right, the neon night run is actually organized by our own students for part of the uh, course uh, work, and um, they came to see me uh, last week actually, right, and uh, told me that um, they have not got the targeted number. Huh? They are expecting 350 participants. Last week on Friday, I think they only managed to get about uh, 200 participants, so they are worried they might not break even for that particular neon night run, and. Um, of course, the CEO mentioned it's going to be a culture. Every year, QIU will organize this neon night run. So there's no day run. And the neon night run will cost a little bit more than the day run. So they're worried eh, whether they can break even or not. Not to make money. Actually, the profit actually is supposed to go to Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Pendidikan Khas Ipo. If they make any profit out of it. But they're more worried whether they can uh, actually break even or not. So I let them worry for a few more days. Eh? I have not sit down to, with them to discuss what solution that um, we can propose. Let them worry until tomorrow. Eh? Tomorrow I'll meet them and discuss. I think that's how we teach students also. Eh? This resilience to try to face, uh, face failure in whatever that we do. And in real life also, I think that's very true. If we fail once, get up and try again. Right? Um, now, the question posed to me by the uh, moderator just now are the challenges, right? In the private higher education system, actually, um, with regards to um, uh, IR 4.0 and producing IR 4.0 ready graduates. I think as a private higher educational institution, of course, we face a lot of problems. Um, our main problem will definitely be, be resources, and manpower, unlike um, my friend beside me, my colleague from UPSI, 
uh, being a government university, uh, shouldn't have lots of problem with that regards and also UTP, right? Uh, Petronas is behind UTP. Of course, we, we face a lot of problem with resources and uh, manpower and we need to plan accordingly and make sure that um, we use our resources and manpower productively. So, um, COVID-19 is another issue that we face, I think. Personally, when I reported at uh, QIU, about two weeks after reporting at QIU, the government tell everybody to stay home. Huh? I was about 60 years old already at that time. So I thought I better quit and stay at home. Huh? Uh, why bother about working online, doing, uh, doing a lot of things, meeting online, everything virtual. But I think I managed to learn and... Um, pick up quite fast and able to survive um, COVID-19. I was also quarantined at once, once in a, a, a go at um, one of the center. So I think, of course, uh, if I manage to survive, the student, they are better at surviving all these challenges. Right? Um, another issue with the private institution is unable or refuse to understand the changing trends of the job market, I think. Of course, being a small university, QIU, I think we do not face that problem as much because we are a speedboat, huh? we are very agile. We are not like a big giant with 50,000 students. Right? It's difficult for big universities to change, I think, but uh, we do not face that problem. And then the next problem we face are uh, these um, unable to rethink the delivery methods of the curriculum and then uh, moving forward with the creativity and timely personalized teaching and assessment has been brought up many, many times, right? The way we assess students will also definitely have to change with the changing times. Uh, the way we teach will also definitely have to change. I remember I started teaching in 1982. Huh? It was before Education 1.0 also. Huh? I think Education 1.0 started, like they say, 1993. Yeah? Started before that, huh? I used to tell my student every time before I start the lecture, switch off your handphone or put it in uh, silent mode. Nah? If it rings during my lesson, my teaching, then you dance according to the ringtone. But I think it's changed a lot. Nah? Now we are allowing students to bring in devices to the classroom. Um, next problem faced by um, uh, private universities in general uh, continuous uh, lack of continuous quality improvement system for creative uh, and innovative approaches. Okay, um, student um, and digital citizen challenging and wanting more and different experience. Right, we need to change also with the needs of the student who have wide access to current and wide range of resources, and. Um, we have been able to actually at QIU to address most of this problem. Eh? Let me highlight what we have done at QIU to address some of these problems. All right. Uh, we have, uh, what we did at QIU, um, as mentioned by some of uh, my colleagues here, is um, we have this um, incubator Program. Of course, we have the internship program. All our programs, all the students will have to go to an internship. We have also started a new uh, program known as incubator program where especially our accounting students are sent to um, an audit firm once a week eh, to work at an audit firm before the end of the final semester. And we have this uh, also philosophy of leaving no one behind at QIU, right? Uh, we have a range of students at QIU, right? Uh, of course, we'll try as best as possible to address the graduate on time requirement, but we are more based on competency teaching. So we will make sure our students are competent before we let them go out to the world and work. Fantastic. Um, we have also done um, WBL, work-based uh, learning, for some program, uh, especially for the diploma in early childhood, right? And um, we are also thinking, uh, actually, how to tackle the chat GPT, of course, as most universities. Um, 
the director of academic division will be uh, coming up with the uh, procedure SOP and how to handle this chat GPT but on a personal discussion with my colleague at the faculty um, for now we are not saying no to chat GPT okay right but later we want the student to come up in front and present what has been prepared by probably chat GPT or they prepare themselves it's right a good idea. So that's our preparation on how to make sure that our graduates are ready for the for AR. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Rahim. Um, we're running short of time, so our apologies for the lack of time management. We're going to eat into the second session a little bit, uh, but I still would like to hear the thoughts from our, our speakers. So perhaps we can keep it to about three minutes each. I think uh, we'll be... Yeah, okay, uh, over to you, Prof. Nato. Uh, thank you. So I only have a very short time. So I'm just going to do uh, some sort of like a simple exercise since I seem that somebody is, uh, you know, uh, it's, this is this, a uh, very challenging session. How many of you have been studying at the government school? Okay, quite many. Okay, thank you. How many of you are a teacher or were a teacher or was a teacher? Satu, dua, tiga, empat, lima. Okay. How many of you are from JPN or KPM? Jabatan Pendidikan uh, Negeri or Kementerian Pendidikan Malaysia? None. Okay, now I'm just... Huh? One. From? Oh, itu Dr. Maisara. Uh, she's from IDR. Okay, uh, I was a teacher, teaching in uh, primary and secondary school. So my topic is such a hot topic now in Parliament. You know, the, the, the what do you call it? The the workload of teachers and stuff. And he said that it is all-time high now. Hey, come on. What's that? Why you choose to be a teacher? That is the life of a teacher. That is the life of a teacher. You know? People said that you know, being a teacher is easy. You just work about six days a week from 7.30 to 1.30 and then you can go home. You know, and then weekend you can spend your time with your families and stuff. Come on. From three to five, you have to train the pidato team. And then five to seven, you have to train the bola sepak team. And during weekend, you have to go to pengakap camping and stuff, all those kind of things. It's always all time high. So the issues now is that how we want to prepare the future generation of teachers towards this. And like Prof. Gopi said, you know, some of them, you know, we have a very good resilience. Resilience to change. You know, not all, but some. So these are the things. So I'm a big, I'm a biggest critics about, you know, uh, the one year programs. I mean, uh, when uh, you have uh, 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 flocks of graduates didn't get a job and stuff. So the easiest way is to graduate them and give them one year diploma so that they can be teacher. No, I don't believe in this. Because teachers is the mole of the current generation. You know? You, you have to have the best brain to be teachers because, you know, you're training the next king or sultan. Yes, yes, you can keep clapping your hands. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You are training the next prime minister or even the secretary general of the United Nations. No, so therefore, it is truly important. So that's what we are now doing in UPSI. It's not, it's not, uh, I think, one day things and stuff. No, it's a process. It's not easy, you know. The system has been you know, like, like it for ages. They first, they need to know about the truth of being teacher. Do you know that we are not only teaching in SK or SJK or SMK? We have school in hospital. We have school in the prison. We have school in the refugee camp. So this is what UPSI is doing. We have a program with Jabatan Penjara Keluang where we do diploma keusahawanan with the juvenile offenders in Jabatan Penjara Keluang. And now we have a program with Majlis Kelamatan Negara to develop a module and also teaching in the refugees camp in Sabah. We also have a program with Empower Answer Perak where we go to, that's why I know where the Fort Kemah, uh, uh, RPS Banon and stuff, you know, to help and teach the orang asli people. During pandemic, COVID and stuff, and you just imagine, we, we give the tablet to the orang asli. Because it's offline over there. There's no internet and stuff. Plus, you know, uh, 
and also the Tafis student. Now there are so many Tafis, most of the Tafis don't have SPM. So they cannot go to the university and stuff. You know, the inclusivity, the accessibility. So first, in teacher training, it is truly important for us to get the best and also the most sincere student. It's not easy to, to, to do it, you know. And they need to know the truth of being a teacher. You just imagine if you are posted to uh, somewhere in the Borneo and stuff, Ulubaram. You have to take the Asia and then the small Fokker. After the small Fokker, the boat laju. After the boat laju, then three hours, four-wheel drive. And then after that, there's a small boat, kecil. Then you have to walk. Yeah. You have to walk about two hours to the school. And you can only go to the nearest town, which is Ulubaram, at least once a month. And they have tons of money. Because they didn't spend. You know, all the foods are there, you know, all the, 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 the local villages people giving them and stuff. So that is the things. So how we expose them to the reality? You know, they watch too many Korean movies. Netflix, drama, pukul tujo. So those are where the Malays, the Chinese and also the Indian eating using forks and stuff. You know, driving, uh, what? Bentley stuff. You know, so that's the issue. So second, the ruh keguruan. Passion to be a teacher. You can listen to Dr. Gopi, Prof. Gopi. I know that he will be such a great teacher. You know, you know, I'm sure you will be loved by the students, you know, with the jovial manners and stuff, you know. You, you are one of the superstars at school. And then the character of a teacher. You know, you are generating the future generation. You must have a very good resilience, you know. I, I don't know, uh, maybe the young man over there will ask about chat GPT and stuff. You might be, uh, oh, dengan I atau apa, you know. They call the current generation is the strawberry generation. You cannot touch them. If you touch them, it will bump. Strawberry, you know, once you hold the strawberry, it's it even worse than duku. Or langsat, you know, langsat, you, you pegang, then uh, two or three days, then only it bump. But strawberry, you hold it, then it bump. So how? How? So what we do is that we reintroduce, you know, see, the Bina Insan program, where they're going to go into the outdoors and stuff. You know, they live in a very simple life. They do adventurous things, not the technical one. No, I don't want them to be another Mohandas who climb Everest or what. No, but, you know, to experience all the hardness. You just imagine, KPM offered 2,000 places for teachers in Sarawak and more than 15% of those turn out the, the offer. They don't want to go to Sarawak. No, no, I want to teach in Ipoh. I live in Ipoh, so I want to stay with my mom and dad. Okay? So that's the reality. Character building, resilience, teamwork, issues as opportunity. This is what we are trying to do. Multitasking. This is very important. Prof. Gopi said that when you go to school, you don't expect that, you know, I'm a specialization. My specialization in physical education, don't expect I'm going to teach physical education. No. They will ask me to teach Bahasa English or Agama Islam and stuff. No, so this is the reality of life, the reality of what happened in school. Especially government school, they don't have many money. They don't have much money. So I would like to propose to the companies that are here today. You just imagine, we have 1,200 schools in Perak. If one company can sponsor or adopt one school, not one of, one school, you know, be the patron of the school, inshallah, the workforce of Perak will be the best, not only in Malaysia, but in the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prof. Dato. I mean, we do need to uh, move very quickly now, so I'm going to go straight to Dr. Vincent. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I can't comment on the question that you gave me about why uh, private schools are more popular. I, I think a brick will be thrown at me if I do that. For sure. yeah. um, but I can only say that uh, I know why people like the IB programs that we offer in our school, um, because it, it te doesn't teach to an exam teaches kids how to succeed at life. Um, and and I'll, I'll briefly stop there. But it's, it's really interesting. Uh, Zong, I think. Zong asked uh, about the implementation of that. It's not a curriculum change or an execution change. It's only an assessment change. You start by changing the end point, then only you change the curriculum, and then only you change execution. This is just like any normal business strategy. Start with vision, then with plan, then do monitoring and execution. That's all it really is. Um, from Mirza, I think. Mirza, if I'm not mistaken. Um, suggestion, if you want to be an entrepreneur, 
Learn the, the skills, great, but go and meet an entrepreneur, a real one, especially one that's failed three or four times. That's the only way you're going to be an entrepreneur. Talking about it doesn't work. Practicing it is going to give you bad habits. You need to meet a real one. And internships like that, that's about the only thing I can say that really seems to work. That's why incubators, the successful incubators are the ones with good mentor leaders, not good talkers or good lectures or nonsense like that. Uh, chat GPT education definitely going to be happening. It's so simple to tell if uh, an article is written by Chat GPT. It's not even funny. Uh, this, a kid who barely is able to do anything in class suddenly produces this stellar piece of work. I'm a teacher. It's not brain surgery to understand. Okay, hey buddy, you faked it, lah. It's obvious. Okay, I can stick that through Chat GPT zero, which is an anti Chat GPT device, if you want to. But it's pretty obvious. You're not going to get away with that. But it does beg a question. Educators should be embracing ChatGPT and other AI-related technology and not running away from it. It's not scary. It's like a calculator. We know it's coming. We know it's going to get even more intensive. We need to know how to work with it. So there's a lot of examples of educators now who say, for example, this English teacher, okay? Uh, kids, we're going to use ChatGPT to create an outline for an essay. And then I want you to close your computers and write out that essay based on the outline. So this is how you use ChatGPT in education. Very classic example. So super simple. Uh, and it's not a bad thing. It's about, about as bad as using a calculator. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Vincent, for those thoughts. Uh, Prof. Goki. Straight first line. Okay, sure. save 20 seconds. Okay, sure. <laughs> I try to finish in less than two minutes if possible. I'm going to answer Chong's question, Jaya's question, and question you put forward. Okay, number one, when I was in Pulaukutam, let me tell you, only four new teachers entered. The rest are all old-timers, not ready to change, including me. I was not ready to change. I was doing all the nasty things so that the headmaster would send me off, <laughs> sack me. The, the moment he walk around, I'll put my leg on top of the table, you know, and... and Say like that. I, I was do all sorts of funny things. Like. He just watched and went there. One day he called me to the room. I thought, okay, this is it. I'm going to be transferred out. Happy. He just asked and spoke to me. He just spoke to me. He, 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 he just, I don't know what he did. He just spoke to me. He said, why do you become a teacher? And all that and all that and all that. He just touched my heart and tears were flowing on my eyes. I don't know. This just flowed. That moment, I changed. Just, just change like that. And I started being influencing the rest of the teachers to bring in the change. That's how it started. It started from the head. Okay? Uh, because he had empathy. He, he showed careness. He was a good coach, I would say. He did not tell me off. Yes, teaching, it's, it's fantastic. I, I enjoy teaching. I, I love teaching. All right? Dr. One of the things I'm very proud of is Dr. Vincent is a medical doctor, a psychiatrist. Product of University College Fairview in terms of teacher training. <laughs> I used to tell him once, you know, you, you, you doctors, uh, you know, in the, in the operation theater, you make one mistake, uh, one fellow die. But a teacher make a mistake in the class, uh, one generation could die. Really. So, very important role we have to play here. To answer the question, anyone asked, do they have the skills? Do they have uh, knowledge and experience? How to employ them? See, the way we design our course in University College Fairview, all our courses are designed in such a way. You see, we, we believe in this analogy. If you want to be an Olympic swimming swimmer, what do you do normally on a daily basis? You have to be in the swimming pool every day. You cannot be watching a PowerPoint presentation, video on how to swim, a report on how to swim, and then go and become a champion. It doesn't work. So what we do is, we take all the teachers, day one in, you are in a classroom. Day one. Year one, assistant to the teacher. Assistant to the teacher. Assist the teacher. Carry the bag, carry, do, do whatever you want. Day, year two, teacher assistant. Year three, you take up the full load of a homeroom teacher. Alright? Four to six, you come for university lectures. So by the time you graduate, you already got three years of experience. You have teaching experience three years. So you go to any interviews, you just graduated? No. I, yes, in terms of paper qualification, I just graduated, but I've got three years of experience. 
in a school environment. I've got that's why we don't call it practicum. We use terminology called school based experience. They they need to be experienced in how collaboration takes place, how the school policy works, everything. This is the thing. So if you're looking at reskilling, then we have to look at emotional touch. All teachers we they have to go through a program where they are emotionally touched. Just like I was touched. Once you emotionally touch them, no need to say anything. Take the change will take place automatically. Anything else is just words. It has to be an emotional touch. They, you must go through a program. You know, some some of the programs I went through with Dr. Vincent knows. They will cry. The teachers will cry. I didn't do anything. I didn't scold them anything. Just a simple game of a touch game, they'll cry. And then you can see the transformation taking place. We in Fairview Group, we have five schools, which we designed the, the university for one purpose. We cannot find teachers. There are 200, nearly 280 international schools in Malaysia now. Where to get teachers? There is no teacher training college preparing them for international school teachers. But yet we have so many international schools in Malaysia. UK doesn't produce teachers for international school. Australia doesn't produce uh, teachers for international school. They produce teachers for their own school. None. So we designed it in such a way to get students to teach in international school. And we take in Malaysians because Malaysian teachers are excellent teachers. They can go and teach in any country. They have that ability if we give them the skills. And that is the skills IB produces. Because the IB is a philosophy. It's, it's the best practices. It's a one-stop center. It's not a curriculum. Except for the DP level. It's a framework. So all the best practices the, the, in terms of approaches to learning, the importance of student agency, these are done in, in calculated. And that is how the program was designed. So all our program is designed for that purpose. And we want to bring this into the government school. We are very happy. There were 10 schools piloted by the government for IB. We're happy for that. We were, we were slightly influential in that. We know the Mara schools, MRSM is all IB. We're happy for that. And, and so the change is taking place. It's already started all right, to embrace this new way of thinking. Students will be happy to take it. They love it. Parents is another headache because they're not used to it. They say, how come no homework? Ah? How, come, how come your report card got no A, no B, no C, no marks? Man? How come so different? Man? Why I have to come to your school and listen to you give me a talk? I, I pay that for you to talk to me, is it? This is a different environment. Uh, teachers, uh, sorry, Prof. Most I difficult. Need you to quickly Finish. wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I said less than two minutes. Right? <laughs> so sorry for cutting it off, but yeah, thank you for, for that. Uh, and finally, Mr. Lee uh, Chalky. Okay, I will uh, try and be quick and do a little bit of a, a summary here. Um, there was a couple. There was a question related to curriculum, um, and, and a question relating to why do people choose international schools. Um, and I don't think people choose international schools, you know, as an idea. Of it, it's better. I think it just might be different. Um, I think it's horses for courses. I think people have different perceptions. I think some of the reasons that people choose international schools actually are quite mistaken. Um, I think there's plenty of great practice going on within government schools. I mean, at, at Tembipo, we run a, a national school and an international school. Um, so I see the good practice that is going on across our campus. Um, but I think if, if I look at us as a school, you know, we're part of a network of 65 schools around the world. And what we're able to do there is we, we're able to produce or, or provide international learning opportunities. Um, we're able to run a Future Pathways program. Um, our students um, really are taken on from sort of, you know, the earliest years, really from five or six, we're beginning to have those conversations about what their plans are, what it is that they're looking to do in the future so that we can begin to create different pathways through the school. Um, and if we're not able to achieve it through our own campus, we can do it through, you know, working with other campuses um, around the world. Now, one of the advantages we have there as well is that because we're a group of size and, and growing size is a lot of the training that is available for staff through CPD um, 
is, is very research-based, um, but also works on the basis of collaboration between different groups of people in different environments and different countries. Um, as a school, one of the things that we've done um, in the time that I've been here, we've, we've increased the opportunities for students to come in and do their practicums with us, because I think there is a lot to be gained from that. We've built closer and closer relationships with the, the ministry here, um, providing SPM workshops um, and providing training for uh, government teachers as well. So we have, we, we, we're taking on our sort of corporate responsibility there. Um, in terms of curriculum, I think we get caught up with curriculum sometimes because at the end of the day, all curriculum is, is it's a decision of probably some fairly old grey people deciding what should be taught. That's basically what it is. If we take history as an example, a lot of the history we teach happened a long time ago. Hasn't changed. But perhaps what we're trying to do is to change perceptions of what happened. And we want to learn from that experience of history. So curriculum we get hung up on. And the more we get hung up on curriculum, we're not going to be able to adapt curriculum quick enough to keep up with the change that is happening within technology. So what we've got to be really clear about is the type of students we want to come out at the end of our educational system. We've heard lots of things mentioned today, that entrepreneurial spirit, we want people to be able to solve problems. And just to finish, I'm just going to give you a, a very quick example. I had a group of students come to see me perhaps three months ago. The time is not so important. But they came to me with a, with a, with a real look on their face. They were very, very concerned you know, like a lot of schools, you know, we, we, we have cars that drive around our compound and go through the compound. And, of course, we've got snails on our compound. And some of these children had noticed that these snails were getting crushed on the road. So they wanted to come up with a solution for that. And so they came to see me, and they talked about what their concerns were, why we needed to make a difference, why we needed to, to care about this. And so, pass the problem back to them. Okay, take it away, come up with solutions, put your thoughts together, come back and present. You know, so this, this process went through a number of stages, a number of stages, which ended up with them building a snail bridge. Okay, obviously not where the road is passing through, but a, a snail bridge. Now, obviously, one thing they hadn't worked out is it's very difficult to train snails. They don't necessarily know where to cross. So, in creating this snail bridge, they've realized that snails are still getting crushed somewhere else. So, what they've done is they've taken that idea and they've gone away and they're now thinking about new ideas, new plans. Now, as part of that process, they had to come up with the idea, so they had to care. They had to become invested in it. They needed to have presentation skills to go and talk to not just their head of school, but the campus principal. They needed to think about how would they finance this. They needed to think about design. So they're bringing technology into this. And they had to take on board failure. So when we think about a day in school or a couple of months in school, what schools are about, I genuinely believe, is about those wow moments, those things you remember, those people you remember. And so as schools, it's our job to inspire and give opportunities for students to really direct their learning. I don't think there's one bit of curriculum that would have been written that would have been more valuable to that group of six or seven six-year-olds that built that snail bridge. And that, to me, is what education is about. It's about creating opportunities for six-year-olds to talk right the way through the school, come up with plans, adapt them, accept failure, come up with a different design. And I think that's the way that we can try and keep pace with the digital age. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And we, we have to call a session to end. We are way over time. Uh, I'd just like you to give another round of applause to our speakers. I wish I could summarize their points, but I don't have time for that either. So uh, thank you so much for your sharing. Thank you. Um, Zayn? Thank you so much. Uh, group picture? Uh, can we invite the panel to the front of the stage for a group photograph? Or